Welcome to the Virtual Concert Halls live show. Today I have the great pleasure of hosting a panel discussion with some of our amazing judges from the 2021 Sound Espressivo Global Competition. Our panel will talk about what it means to be judging modern competitions in our modern digital age, but we'll talk about so much more than that. So hang on tight, we're going to have a fantastic time. Hello and welcome to the Virtual Halls Concert Live Show. So I want to introduce our guests for today and ask them a few questions and then we're going to have our discussion session. Uh, and at the end, we're going to have a Dear Young Musician segment and it's going to be pretty amazing. Now, our first guest uh, for tonight is called Dr. Angela Chan and she uh, is the founder and director of Lambda School of Music and Fine Arts. She holds a doctorate in piano performance, pedagogy and education from Concordia University, Montreal. She has an unbelievably successful music school and has unraveled the mysteries of effective and efficient learning. Her students have performed all over the world in major international piano competitions as well as famous venues such as Carnegie Hall and the Royal Albert Hall. She is the author of the new Lambda Piano Method series developed to help pianists progress at an accelerated rate. She has a new book called The Guide to Musicality, the Art and Science, which might be of interest to young musicians and teachers. Uh, and this book, she discusses what it means to teach musicality. And this is something that we're going to talk about today as well. Uh, she is recognized internationally as an adjudicator of major uh, music competitions. She is a senior examiner and clinician at the Royal Conservatory of Music and she is a pedagogical consultant to the iScore project and has lectured at Concordia University. Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Angela. Hello, hi Chris, thanks for having me. No, it's my pleasure. So I'm going to have a quick question to start you off and also to kickstart our discussion a little later on. And so a question for you would be, as a judge of competitions, what is one of the most important aspects of performance that you look for? I think all the competitors who prepare for a competition is definitely very fluent and uh, takes pains to polish the technical elements already. So I think the most important part that distinguishes ourselves and brings forth our musical personality is in our musical expression. Mm. And every person has a unique way of saying something from their heart because, well, we could play the same repertoire, but we can have infinite uh, interpretations for this repertoire, which makes it distinguishable from one to the other. And this is a unique language that represents us, that through this music, we are speaking from ourselves to the audience. So I think uh, a message to young musicians is that trust your instinct, be brave, bring out your message of what you understood from the music and bring forth your voice through your music so that we can hear you. That is the most unique and the most precious part of music making. And I hope that you can enjoy that experience. It's great freedom that you can express yourself and there's no constraints. Bring it I forth. I really love that you said that because I think that's really, uh, a competition I think is a practice for real life performance and what it means to perform and discover your voice. And competitions, even if you win many of them, end at some point. And if you learn to develop your unique voice, if you do learn to develop what it means to be uh, expressive at the piano, musical and an art, an artist, then you can carry that with you for the rest of your life as you perform. That's really good advice. Thank you, Dr. Angela. Uh, and our next guest is um, Annie Cent Chang Center, uh, who is a violist and a pianist. I'm really <laughs> amazed that she can play both at a very professional level. Uh, since she's come from the, to the US at the age of 13, Annie has performed in Europe, Asia, and the US as a soloist, chamber, and orchestral musician. She has performed as a piano soloist in, with some major 
symphonic orchestras, including the San Francisco Symphony, the Hong Kong Philharmonic, and the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. As a violist, she has performed at festivals such as Marlboro, uh, Ravinia, and has collaborated with members of the Juilliard, Guarneri, and Emerson uh, string quartets. While living in Arizona, she was the assistant principal violist of the Phoenix Symphony, the principal vi violist of the Phoenix Symphony Sinfonietta, and the Arizona Chamber Orchestra, for which she performed regularly as a viola soloist. Uh, she was also the pianist of the Concorda Trio with cellist uh, Michael Center and violinist Dana Paisley. Currently, she uh, plays with the Baltimore Chamber Orchestra. Uh, Annie is a uh, person of many talents. She also works as an arts administrator, teacher, and visual artist. And she is current, uh, she's, she was the marketing and artistic director for the Academy of Music Northwest for five years. She also writes and she's a writer for the International Rescue Committee uh, newsletters and is passionate about performing in concerts to benefit organizations that provide assistance to homeless people, refugees and victims of natural disasters. Welcome to the show, Annie. It's Thank really nice you. to have you. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, my pleasure. So I, my question for you will be uh, when you give immediate feedback to competitors, which is something that's really a unique part of our competition, what do you think is the most important thing or one of the more important things for competitors to hear after they've performed? I think constructive cri criticism is really crucial. Hmm. They need to know first what their strengths are. I think it's always good to start with something positive. And the next thing would be what what I can say or what, what judges can say to help the competitor competitor to be able to play at the next level. So it's whatever they need to work on. For, for some, and that could be many different things, for some could be tone quality or finding their own voice, like what Dr. Angela Chang was saying earlier. And I think finding that authenticity in yourself and your playing is really important. That's what will set you apart from the other competitors or other musicians. And I think it's also, it's, it's really important to just trust, know yourself, learn about yourself, learn about what music means to you. And every, every note, every phrase, every composition should be personal to you in some way. I really like that. I, I, I always think I wish I heard that advice a little earlier in my conservatory days. I think there's a tendency uh, when you're competing or even playing in master classes, every performance, that you feel like you have to nail every note. You have to play every passage perfectly and that it's all about uh, not making any mistakes and being solid and a concrete artist, which is very important as well. But I think as an audience, what people really listen for is that unique voice, that artistry, that expression, uh, and they want to hear something a little bit different that's special to you. And both of you touch upon that uh, really well. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion uh, about that as well, especially with uh, Dr. Angela's book, on a, guide, a Guide to Musicality. Uh, the third guest and also moderator of uh, our discussion session is August Antonov, and he is on the advisory board for the 2021 Sound and Space Receiver Global Com Competition. He is a phenomenal pianist who has studied all over the world from Bulgaria, France to the US and has played with many major um, uh, pianists and worked with them. He has collaborated with contemporary and amazing composers of our day such as Carter Pan and recorded their works. He is a judge uh, of multiple international piano competitions all over the world and is also the judge of our 2021 Sound Espresso of a Global Competition. Uh, you can check out our interview uh, together uh, from Monday uh, at, our, at our website or also on our Facebook and YouTube page. Welcome to the show, August. Thank you so much for moderating the session. It is a pleasure to be here. Nice to see you, Chris, Annie and Andrew. Nice to meet you guys in person. Likewise. Yeah, Likewise. love it. <laughs> I'm going to let you take the reins on this, because of course I'll still be here, but I wanted to talk about uh, how and if you have any thoughts about what Dr. Angela and Annie has said so far. So, um, uh, I think both Angela and Annie are right, and uh, you know, people can, can, can hear much of everything else I've said in our previous interviews. One thing I'll add to that is that... Um, one thing we cannot forget is that this is a show. 
uh, when we perform, we're not just performing for ourselves, we're performing for an audience. So uh, we have, in a way, we have to create a show for the audience, whether the audience is virtual or or in or, in, or live. Uh, so so that's something that, that I'm lo always looking for uh, in contestants, whether they can bring that spark uh, where I can feel or hear the spark. It's not so much about the notes, but can you get me excited about your performance? Uh, can you can you get me that feeling of I want to stand up and give you a standing ovation? <laughs> uh, you know, so that's very important to me as well. In addition to everything else we've said over over the over the year, over the past year or so, and what Andrew and, and Annie have said today. I think what you're talking about is connecting with the audience, right? I think I think it's really important for a performer to never forget that your audience is right there and what you're trying to do is, what you're trying to convey is really to communicate with them, to, to connect with them, to, to share something that you feel so deeply about or, or you want to inspire them or or excite people, that kind of thing. As, as, um, yeah, absolutely. Earlier. You're absolutely right. It's it's uh, what I what I like to say. It's more about being entertainment. Uh -huh. uh, entertainment in a in a pure sense of the world, like uh, uh, like what rock stars are doing, uh, like the you know the Rolling Stones connection with their audience. You know, we we have to. We, we we're, I'm looking for that type of connection or sometimes with, with performers as well yeah. uh, and, and I, same with the with the contestants so so one pianist that comes to my as you were describing this is Yu Jia Wang yeah and so <laughs> as we know her 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 personality is she, she is not shy about dressing in a way that's different from the traditional ways of of how classical musicians dress. And and I think that in itself, you know, I, I think people have mixed opinions about it, but I think what you're talking about when it comes to the entertainment showmanship aspect of things, she has it. But I think with that, you do have to have a, a artistry and authenticity to back that up in the classical music world. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, right. I, I am I am not going to name any names, but we, we <laughs> own, uh, I am not going to call anybody out, but we all know people that, uh, <laughs> yes. that do that, uh, that shouldn't be doing. Um, right. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, yeah. It will get me in Thank trouble otherwise. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Angela, I want to see if yes. you can give some practical mm -hmm. notes on what it means to, uh, like uh, Abko says, put on a show or mm -hmm. be entertaining or special. I think these are very ethereal words and mm -hmm. I think maybe a practical approach is really necessary. Right. I think one wowing factor and also a good way to train ourselves is to push the envelope, to push the envelope of what you believe you're capable of delivering. Whether it's this pianist or another pianist, we, are, we got that wow factor because we feel that the elements of the p human potential has been tested and they are successful in it. We can test it in many different ways by extending this envelope and we all bring in our own personal signature, who we are as a defining characteristic to the music. But one very important element is, as a musician, we practice day in, day out. We're in this humdrum. What's important is to keep this fresh in our minds, fresh that every time when we try to say, to speak through this music, it has to remain a certain value that we feel is constantly developing inside so that it doesn't go just like a pure recitation where with more practice it loses its meaning to you then what can you express so it's very important to keep that spark always continuously find in the music seek inspiration you can listen to uh, even youtube listen to recordings continuously discover what's in the music that makes it, revives it, gives it a sparkle so that every time when you 
uh, practice, there's a reason behind it. It's not just to make it better, but to push your own envelope to develop and really bring justice to these magnus opus to mm. share it with the audience and so the judges. What would you say to you? Uh, so I want to turn this into a way for young musicians to make this practical, because I yes. think it's important mm -hmm. that we talk about pushing the envelope. But what does it mean? You know, apart from listening to recordings of other pianists play, let's say a sh piece by Chopin, what are other ways do you, th mm -hmm. you feel? And I'll bring this you know, to everybody to answer that they can continue to make this fresh? How do you find inspiration? Because I personally mm -hmm. don't think um, it's just at the piano. You can watch movies, go to art galleries, and mm -hmm. incorporate examples from all over the place to really inspire you. What are your thoughts on that? I think there are two aspects, a general one and a more concrete one. General mm. one is enrich your knowledge of everything so that you can make connections with the music so that you as a person develop more fully so you have content you have correlations so that out of music is just a tip of the iceberg where you express mm. yourself like but that. you have a wide knowledge base so that you have things to speak you have things yeah. to talk about mm. but then mm. in order to do that i think you can do two things first self-critique after don't just practice for repetition but critique yourself what's the problem how can i make it better and yeah. also play for your fellow people, like not just your teacher, you, you've gotten enough feedback from your teacher, but from people that would listen to you and not just critique on you, but on a collegial basis. It may be your classmates, maybe your musical friends, because they are not looking at you from high above, they are at your level. And there is a level of sharing and mutual understanding. When you are able to learn from your peers, you're also able to learn better from your professors. Wow, that's excellent advice. Annie, do you have anything to say about that? That's really this remarkable advice. Thank you, Dr. Angela. My pleasure. I, I want to add to that, that experimentation is a mm. really good thing to do um, to keep things fresh. So when we look at standard repertoire, there are typical ways that everybody does in terms of interpretation. And I think it's really important to sometimes kind of take things apart a little bit and change things up a little bit. So mm -hmm. for instance, in terms of pacing, if everybody does the, the, the same retard somewhere, try something a little bit different. Try different tone colors. If you have multiple voices, try rebalancing your voice. So instead of, of always doing bring out the bass and, and the top, change up with bring out the inner voice, can, can feel, change the, the texture of the music. So I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways to keep things fresh and, and just to, just by experimenting and not be afraid to try different things. I think that sometimes can, can help. Mm -hmm. I really like that. August, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, this? everything Angel and Annie have said is, is exactly on point. Uh, uh, one thing maybe that I will add is regarding inspiration, how to find inspiration. Um, I think listening to what the legends in the business have done uh, is a wonderful way. Uh, to 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 get inspiration, uh, you know. B back in my day, uh, I used to have a collection of uh, every of every recording of uh, uh, Rachmaninoff concertos by every single person out there, be it Horowitz, uh, Ashkenazi, or Wild, you name it. Entremont, I had them all. I was I was listening over and over to, to not to copy, but to just inspire myself on what they were doing. So I think that's that's an important aspect to to do it. Uh, another one is to record uh, to record oneself and listen mm -hmm. to oneself play it. Uh, it's not not that much done nowadays, but it should be should done more often. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah. Thank you for that. So th uh, th that's really good advice. I think um, to summarize and. Please feel free to add more if you feel like I missed anything. But I think the major advice for young musicians to in, in a competition is, first of all, to stay fresh and make this music something that is personal. Uh, and the ways to do that is, uh, as Dr. Andrew said, to go out and be a 
be a better person, <laughs> experience more in this world, uh, expand your horizons on what you know, uh, and then also play for your peers and listen to yourself to reflect. And I think these are really good pieces of advice for young musicians moving forward. Now, the next uh, part of what I want to ask all of you is because you are all judges for this sound and specific global competition. What do you think is um, a major part of judging these days that is different, for, you know, especially now that we're all online. What does it mean for you to be a judge now? Um, does it mean, and, and, and we get some criticism, or not criticism, but a suggestion that, you know, maybe judging is a very harsh word, you know, as though we're putting some judgment onto competitors or something of that sort. Um, but we have to label things. We have to say, oh, this is better than the other. Uh, we have to say perhaps that we enjoyed this performance more than a different performance or that this was more technically uh, proficient than the other. Do you have any thoughts on what it means to be a judge now? Uh, I'll have Dr. Angela start if that's all okay, right. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, um, as a judge, I've adjudicated a lot of competitions, many of which are li were live. And then mm -hmm. during this uh, pandemic period, it became virtual. Uh, specifically to this one that um, we're talking about, mm, it, it, this virtual competition, I love it personally because it balances the, the video element as well as the life aspect. So I think I would use different parameters to judge each one. In terms of the video, um, first I would dismiss the recording quality because we are not in the same playing field. Some may be recording with an iPhone and some may be doing it in a recording studio. But I think that has no bearing on the actual performance. I would try to siphon out all the other extraneous noises and really truly listen to the performer per se. And if it is a solo, I think I would personally focus on the rapport between the performer and me as a listener to see if he, is, he or she is really bringing forth from his heart that particular message that's very dear to him. And if it is in an ensemble, I would also mm. judge based on the interaction between this performer with maybe the collaborative musicians around or as an ensemble. So I have to be very careful to see if I, who I am there to judge. Is it to judge the ensemble? Or if sometimes I have the experience of a very outstanding performer, but unfortunately the collaborative performer, performer is not very experienced. So I wouldn't take that into account. I have to be very careful to siphon that out. Now, then if when we go to the actual performance, I would treat it as a live competition. And for mm -hmm. that, I would listen for that engaging personality, almost like a life platform. Is there the spark? Is there that engagement? And I look for that, assuming that all the technical elements are in place. But if, of course, some may not be, well, then I'll judge accordingly. Another thing I would really take into account, hopefully, is to see the age and the experience because if you see someone who is very young and you know, well, the kid is five years old, how many years could that child would have learned the piano? That I would have to judge it according to what is the expectation of such, a, such an age. So I would factor in a number of multiples just to make sure that it's on a level playing field for everyone so that yep. is a meaningful uh, participation. No, really. Thank you for that in-depth and detailed answer. I think it's important that all these elements are accounted for, and it, it makes it being a judge quite difficult because you're thinking and analyzing, you, you, uh, as well as trying to enjoy the music as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've been a judge of multiple competitions. What are your thoughts on all this? You know, I think, um, first of all, I agree with what... Uh, uh, Andrew has, has said, um, but I also think we we we, uh, the, we need to stop with the being concerned about the terminology we use because you started with that question, uh, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, regarding judging. Um, there is no there is no two ways about it. 
whether it is virtual or in person, uh, competitions are meant to be judged. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is meant, it is meant to cho- to be to, for for the judges to choose the best out of the field, um, and diminishing that aspect of it, it's is is not good either. Um, now at the same time, the you know judges and each judge is different. Uh, but judges have their own have ways to also express sympathy with the participants to make them feel more welcome. Uh, yeah. But th- there's, we've got to stop with uh, playing with the words. Competition, it's about judging. Uh, it's about choosing the best in the field, uh, however that is. Thank you for that. And I think the kind of on the other on the other hand, uh, while it is a competition and you are being judged, it's important, I think, as a competitor not to take it all too personally because these are all personal <laughs> judgments. And to realize, yes, you know, maybe so-and-so judge may not have liked my playing, but that's not a personal reflection on my own process. You know, that, that like, as Dr. Andrew said, you play for your peers, you play for your teacher, you, you listen to yourself. These, I think, are really important markers of where you're at. And just because so-and-so judge may not have liked your playing, so to speak, that doesn't mean that you're a failure. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue piano or violin or viola. Oh, absolutely. In, yeah. in, in, I say to my, uh, often to my students is, uh, you know, competitions are a weird beast, to put it mm. mildly. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you, you go, you play well, but you end up in front of a jury that's... Uh, uh, that has woken up on the wrong side of the bed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and is in a bad mood or has spent uh, 10 hours listening uh, to however many musicians before you showed up. Uh, judges are always impacted by whatever happens throughout the day. Uh, they, they woke up, they, they slept badly, they had a bad bed, they had a, they didn't eat breakfast and yep. that impacts how so at the end of the day <laughs> at the end of the day uh, competitions are a way for for musicians to to get a um, you know I'm looking for the for the terminology uh, to get a feedback outside mm-hmm. of their comfort zone yeah simple as that it doesn't yeah. mean it, it doesn't mean that uh, because they've won a competition that the be- the best in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean that they suck if they if they got the last place. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's just feedback that they can use to improve themselves. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, I always think about it as a way to improve yourself. Exactly, that's exactly it. Like it's a way to just put pressure on yourself to improve, get your playing to a certain level, and then just that's it. Um, Annie, I would love to. But you know, your, uh, mm. you know, before uh, before Annie jumps in, one thing we talked about Chris last uh, last time is that we put ourselves down pressure because we want to show up for fellow <laughs> for for a musician from uh, from the same university or the same class. We want to show up. To them, show them that we're yeah. the best. So we put ourselves that pressure as well. Yeah, there's a competition. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a competition exactly. because we exactly. want to compete, <laughs> exactly. and we do yeah. want to be better. And it's not it's not a bad thing to want to be better. Uh, I think it's a uh, that's our human pursuit. Uh, and do you have any thoughts on this? And I'd love to hear uh, in our pre pre-chat uh, before we entered this broadcast. Um, Annie, you mentioned something that really struck me that playing the viola actually helped you become a better pianist or informed your piano playing. And we're talking with Dr. Angela about, you know, becoming more uh, human, you know, a- a- acquiring more knowledge. Do you have any thoughts on on that and what we've said so far? I, I do. I have, <laughs> I have thoughts with many different um, topics that's related to this one right now. But mm-hmm. before I get into any of that, I, I wanted to share a line that two great pianists have said the same thing. And um, what, what these two pianists said is, competing is like going to 7-Eleven buying a lottery ticket. I don't know if you can guess who said it or, or if you have heard it, 
Um, yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> Emmanuel X is one of them, and Gary Goldson is the other one. So yeah, <laughs> I think they're you know, and they both have won international competitions. So so um, they're experienced. So there's a lot to say about that line. It's I think all competitors, especially the younger ones, when they're just starting out, they need to understand to not be attached to the outcome. Even if you win, you don't want to say, okay, I'm the best, I'm done, <laughs> you know, I'm done playing. You, you have to always think about what can I do to be better next time, whether you win or not. And for, for those who, um, okay, let me, come, let, me, let me come back to, to your question. I don't want to stray mm-hmm. away. Yeah, no, go yes. ahead, go ahead, yeah. Um, so, so in terms of a p- being a pianist, I think for a lot of pianists, it, it, if you can learn another instrument, orchestral instrument, I think it, it can be incredibly helpful in understanding the piano playing and, and the repertoire from a whole different perspective. Um, you can hear piano music in a more orchestral way, and that's going to change the way, it's going to shift the way you listen for voices, for different lines, and for different textures. Um, so, so I think in terms of that, that's very helpful. And of course, as an orchestral musician, there's the, the social aspect of things as well, because we get to play in small ensembles, we get to play in an orchestra, and playing in, I th- for pianists, I think it's very important that you play in some kind of small ensemble, so you learn how to connect with others through music, through your own instrument. So. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, and I, I wish I actually, I started learning the violin at, at a young age, but um, my parents thought that I should be even more well-rounded and so I had to pick up different sports and other things and so I couldn't continue with the violin but I, 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 can, I can understand how if you were to play other instruments how and, and that's why some pianists go into conducting as well like they, they get a more s- bigger sense of what the world that the composers themselves are listening to are a part of yeah, yeah. You know, it's in, I actually like what Annie was saying because mm-hmm. We, we as a as pianist, and as you know it, as you know it, Chris, we are so alone on stage, usually. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually we're alone, uh, except with orchestra. But even then, we we lead the orchestra, uh, mm-hmm. and so playing chamber music, you know, uh, doing, um, being part of an ensemble, be it uh, orchestral ensemble or wind symphony. Uh, or whatever, or doing conducting classes, that gives another perspective on a whole, on a whole business, on mm-hmm. a whole, on the on the whole side of things. Uh, it gives another perspective on what we, what the other people hear. Uh, it gives a perspective on uh, on everything that 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 is being done on stage, and I think that's something that's that we need to have more of. Mm. Thank you for that. And uh, I want to bring my question back to Annie for a quick second. And I want to okay. ask, you know, in terms of um, playing, uh, we talked about keeping it fresh. And one thing about playing uh, with uh, an orchestra is you're kind of at the whim of the conductor. You're not, you're not a soloist. You're part of an ensemble and you're not the star. Uh, and as pianists, I think usually we get, get, kind of get used to the idea that maybe we're kind of a star. Even when we're collaborating, <laughs> we want to be the star. You know, <laughs> we want to make our our solo come out even nicer. Or how, can you talk a little bit about what it is to you know be a violist in a in an orchestral setting, but also in a chamber setting, and how has that informed your musicality and your musicianship? I'm actually a very shy person, so okay, the that orchestra helps. <laughs> life, you know, being a violist was perfect for me <laughs> because I just. <laughs> fit in. <laughs> I'm very good at that. Um, no, so so to, to try to keep it fresh, I think that was your question, as, as an orchestral player, you know, as full-time symphony players have to play the same program at least three or four times, sometimes more. And if we're doing educational concerts, I have done the same program 10 times in the same week. So <laughs> how do you... How do That's you a lot, keep yeah. that is a lot. How do you how do you keep that fresh? And and I have play in 
certain scenarios where I was actually the soloist, yeah. as a viola soloist. And, and every concert, I would think of something a little bit different to focus on. And it always comes, comes back to music. Everything comes back to music. So, so I try to listen to a different part or try to think about my line a little bit differently, try to, to think how my line interacts with the orchestra. So, so every concert, I just pick one thing that's different from what I was focusing on before. So that's I kind of that. my trick. And when I'm sitting in the orchestra, let's say we're doing Mahler's symphony, which is, you know, the symphonic works are amazing. And they're so mm -hmm. complex that even if I have to play the same concert five times, there are always different things that you would discover if you pay attention to it. Like sometimes for me, it's listening to a really beautiful oboe solo or flute solo or the horns, you know, there, there are plenty of things you can focus on, even if you're not so comfortable or happy <laughs> with the directions that you're given in a moment. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, it, being a violist, you're pretty down in a totem pole. So <laughs> you have to listen to quite, quite a few people above you. <laughs> yeah, you get but very then, little say on how anything yeah, goes. A lot of times, yeah, you just kind of keep your mouth shut and say, okay, I'll make the best of this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is it's a very internal game. It's a very, in, it's in your mindset and in your psychological, psychologically, how you think about things. And it's an attitude thing too, which I really like. It's not just, I'm so bored. It's like, oh, what can I do to listen to this differently? Dr. Angela, in your teaching with students and in your Lambda school, I want to ask, how are you teaching students to, to do that? Because a lot of the time they're playing the same repertoire mm -hmm. for multiple occasions or competitions how are you getting them to be inspired and have that spark when they perform you know the same Chopin scherzo for the you know 15th time or something like that it's very true that in a live performance well uh, that I find what's special is through a live performance we get the energy from the audience that is constantly in flux and for every performance we play for a different audience, hopefully. Even if it is the same audience, they'll give us a different vibe. And mm -hmm. that freshness we can take from the audience. And in my teaching, uh, I'm very fortunate because in my school, I have a full-size concert hall with a 200 seating capacity. That's so incredible. Wow. what I like is that my students, they play in open rehearsals. So in their lessons, they play in the concert hall. So they know about the acoustics, all those things to make adjustments for, and the lesson takes place in the concert hall. The next step is when they are ready to perform, we invite their classmates or just any parent that are floating by, they can just come in and watch. So that gives them the vibes of playing the, and trying out their repertoire to an unknown audience, even at the phase of development. It doesn't have to be fully formed, but that gives you the feedback internally to see, oh, it doesn't work because, well, just when I'm practicing or even when I'm having my lessons is okay, just someone walked in, I couldn't do it. Where is mm. it? Why did that happen? What is the trigger that led me to become distracted? They can learn from this experience. And I find it extremely helpful because of this kind of training. And after that, I, I like to push the envelope to even a more crazy degree. Sometimes I would set them up with a lot of distractions. And when they are prepared, <laughs> they can overcome those distractions. Some yeah. audience making noise or even turning off all the lights. And once, like, I did something by, like, banging a door, and they kept going. So I said, well, that means you are pretty solid, meaning that you are really into the music. I heard a story that I want to share with you is about uh, a concert pianist. Uh, that was a long time ago. I was told by um, the piano builder because they offered their new piano on stage and they, the pianist was playing and suddenly somehow it was on full stick. The stick yeah. collapsed and boom, it, like that. And wow. the piano was damaged. The pianist doesn't even move, just continue. The, the audience was fabulous, <laughs> not only because of what happened and that the piano was damaged, but he just continued as if there's nothing. 
that close bond between the musician and the music in honor of the audience that I'm not going to give up no matter what is that spirit, is that essence of being a real musician, that you engage in it so fully and you're not going to let go. So I think mm. that is a very important part of training that you can play for your peers, you can set up situations. I don't recommend anyone suddenly dropping the lid, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's a bit too much. But that's if you much. prepare for the conditions, you yeah. are able to live up to it and take the challenge. That, that reminds me of uh, something I w witnessed, actually. This is Yo-Yo Ma, who mm. can play under any kind of situation. And, and at one point, his, uh, his chair was falling off the platform. He just half stood up, and then he eventually just played through the rest of the, the concert, standing, half standing. Mm -hmm. Didn't miss a beat, didn't miss a note. It was really incredible to watch. And I'm sure that's probably not the only incident he had encountered. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that shows I, that's the, the dedication that I think absolutely. Dr. Angela yeah. was talking about. This is something that ties into what Abgus was saying too, with about it being a show. You know that you, that you don't stop the show. The stop the show keeps going on. And I really I really love uh, both stories that you shared, uh, Angela and Annie. This, this is a this is a way to re get people to and students to rehearse the art of performing. Uh, not, not because, you know, necessary that they want to be performers for the rest of their lives, but this is a, an art. This is a kind of art that you can learn and through your hall, which is a fantastic idea of banging doors. I've heard teachers, you know, they'll, they'll start, you know, uh, banging the thing, or I have a teacher who would eat sometimes during a lesson. <laughs> and so, you know, they'll, 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 oh, this is, this is good. And you hear them eating and, and it's distracting, you know, and you're like, well, what? But you just keep playing, you keep going, and you know that he's listening, you know, <laughs> like he's definitely <laughs> listening. Uh, but it's really just fascinating to see how um, slowly we can develop the experience of being a performer that's not phased by anything that happens, coughing, people leaving, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. anything that happens. Of course, do you have anything to add? No, no, that, those are great stories. I mean, uh, it's it's... It's the it's the good old days of uh, training performers, where we would do whatever it takes to be ready, uh, at, at whatever cost. Uh, no, no, the, the, <laughs> uh, it, it's. But you know, I like what what Andrew was saying as well about that connection with the audience, and you know, it comes back to what we we're talking about on Monday, with the fact that. Or for virtual is here to stay. Uh, it's never going to replace the live, the live connection with the audience, and or both stories, uh, especially Annie's story with, uh, by Yo 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 Ma. It's also a connection with the audience, because when you have when as an audience you you see the artist struggle, whether it is with memory or with. The, with the setting, in the case of a chair or, or the piano that falls down, that that connects even further with the audience. That you know, you continue through that, you're guaranteed to have a standing ovation. You have it's, that yeah. connection, a it and that will, yeah, yeah, and that will never theatrical. be replaced. But yeah. exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, I had a bit of a, the same experience about four years ago. I was playing uh, William Bolcom. Uh, the rags, the piano rags, mm -hmm. and I, I was playing with the music, and my stand fell down in the middle of, uh, of the of the snake, the the famous snake where I have where the pianists have to tap with the with the with the feet and <laughs> and sing with the tongue, and I continued playing because again it's that connection. It, so it's a very similar story. So it it comes back to live audience. Yeah. to the connection with live audience which will never be replaced whatever we do i think it's it's, it's, it's these are really good stories one of my favorite things to watch on youtube is um uh, midori at a very young age when i think he was she was playing with uh leonard bernstein uh her string broke in the middle of a concerto and so she just unfazed handed her you know broken string violin to the concert master took his kept playing 
that string broke too and then went to the assistant <laughs> concert master and kept going. And I think Leonard Bernstein just gave her a huge hug and a kiss afterwards. Like, how does someone at such a young age do that? And I think it's a combination of experience, but also really good teaching. And I want to focus a little bit on this right now because all of your teachers and I want to ask, you know, how do you feel, you know, for teachers who are listening, how would you, what would you say to teachers about preparing their students for competitions. What are some tools or tricks you've had or you do with your students to make sure that they feel comfortable with competing? We mentioned mindset. We mentioned the attitude and way to approach a competition, that it doesn't define you, uh, that you just do it to better yourself. Uh, I want to start with uh, Dr. Angela. How do you approach mm -hmm. it with your students? Well, I teach my students that performance or playing an instrument, for that matter, is a discipline. A discipline means that it requires constant commitment and a level of seriousness in what you put into. And after that, you reap what you sow. And accordingly, when they put their discipline, they grow and become stronger. They do not give up because of uh, outside obstacles. They stick to the commitment. And also, when there is that self-involvement, they will continue to grow and be better. So it's very important, that's the first thing. Without that, nothing can be born out of it. With the discipline, you're going to emerge and continue to grow. The next thing is, as you, earlier I said, you need to expand your boundaries. But by expanding that, you have to be really prepared. Now, my teacher's teacher, uh, my teacher, uh, one of my teacher, her name is Nancy Liu from Hong Kong. And her teacher was Adele Marcus from Juilliard. She told me the story about when she was young and she went to Juilliard. And it was on a cold morning where her teacher asked her to go for her lesson at 6 a.m. So she had to take the metro and go through all that. When she got back to Juilliard, her hands were frozen, completely frozen. And her teacher asked her to play immediately. No warming up. And she managed. And the teacher, Adele Marcus, said, I want you to be 500% prepared so that in the worst of circumstances, you're still able to deliver. It's not that you have to be in prime state. You work in that, but you have the best reserve. You're training for that. That's why I'm saying it's a discipline. Mm -hmm. If you're 500% prepared, even at tremendous degradation, you're down to 100% where generally the norm expects that as perfection. So you can always deliver by being overly prepared. So chance favors the prepared mind. You always get a lot more ready, and that's part of their discipline, and also part of the professional ethics that I instill in the students. It's not just learning for the sake of just having fun alone. You get the fun, you get the achievement and the glory after that when you can over prepare and deliver no matter what. So I make sure that I instill this value in my students. And the second part is that, well, I understand that you want to win in a competition and having that gung-ho attitude is good. But in case you win, keep yourself in check. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it's glorious that now you can be full of yourself because that is the next challenge when you are acknowledged and you don't get out of yourself feeling that you're big, you're no longer maintaining the humility to carry on. This could be your demise. So I keep them in check. So that's what I do to my students. It sounds like you're an incredible teacher but also coach. Uh, I see this a lot of in the sports disciplines that you over prepare, you go through all different kinds of training to make sure that on the actual competition day you can perform and it's, it's difficult and it's pressured but you know you can manage it. And I think this is something, uh, wow, it's, it's really good advice. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Angela. Thank you. Uh, Annie, do you have anything uh, that you'd like to say about uh, preparing teachers and telling, what would you say to teachers who might be preparing their students? Um, uh, myself, I'm a teacher too, but I'm not nearly as experienced as any of you. Um, so what would you say to, to people like this? Well, first, 
We have to think about the physical part of things, the intellectual part of learning music and the mental part of learning music and performing, preparing mm -hmm. to perform or to compete. Um, practicing mindfully is very important. A lot of students, when they first learn anything, or once they have learned the notes, it's very easy for them to just kind of go into the automatic pilot, just run things, <laughs> yeah. you know, mind mindlessly. And that's when, I think that's when a teacher can step in and say, okay, let's take a step back. What are you, are you fixing anything <laughs> as you were playing through? Are you understanding the music? Did you study the score? What does this mean? Do you know the historical background of the piece? What, what, what do you think the composer would do if he or, or she were playing this music? I think, I think to shift the, the way a student think and connect with music and the way they play can, can change their overall playing in the preparation. And another really important thing is consistency and there are many ways of preparing for that one is I find visualization actually very helpful so yeah. it's it's very beneficial for students to practice actually run through a whole program just in their mind I I don't know if um, if people uh, if students or performers I believe a lot of performers do that because mm -hmm. you you have to have a very clear mental image of what it's going to be like when you're on stage, what it's going to be like while you're going through this mu musical journey where you're playing the program, what is that sensation like? What's going on you know, with your fingers? How, how is that going to work with a particular shift for, for a string player or a run for a pianist, that kind of thing? Um, I, I find that kind of thinking repetition very helpful, actually with very difficult spots. So, so there are times if my students are, are struggling with one particular technical thing, I would just tell them, put the instrument away, close your eyes, visualize how you would do it, how you would do that jump or how you would do that shift. And a lot of times when they come back to the instruments, it's they can easy. do it. Yeah. yeah. So, so much <laughs> of it is, is up here. And, and it's yeah. also creating a zone. The athletes talk about that all the time. If you know, if it, it takes practice to figure out how to do that, how to create a zone that nothing can disturb you. So to, to have that is going to help you to be consistent because you're not going to be affected by what's going to happen around you. Because things, a lot of things happen when you have to, right before you play or you know perform or compete, a lot of things yeah. can happen. And, and if you can just, keep yourself in that zone, then you know you can handle anything. And one more thing I want to talk about in terms of being consistent is, this might sound a little cruel, <laughs> but I actually went through it myself, I did it myself, is getting up at any time and mm. run the hardest mm -hmm. thing, you know, that, that you have to play. So, or even if you're sick, you're not feeling well, you don't feel like playing, just make yourself get up and do it. <laughs> and if you can still play at a certain level when you're feeling terrible, then you know, you know you're going to, to play that much better in, in a normal situation. So that's, that's my advice. That's such good advice. Thank you. Uh, did, I want to bring up to any of you, uh, Dr. Angela, and of course to comment on that. There's, also, there's so much there. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's funny. It's 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 funny because uh, uh, Annie was saying exactly what was running through my through my head uh, uh, right now because everything is so about the head. Uh, it's it's about uh, it's about f concentration, thinking, the zone, like you said. Um, one thing that I in in breathing, breathing, lots of breathing. Um, but you know everything Annie was was saying about uh, preparation is is exactly right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we may have read the same book. You, uh, you and me, Annie. Uh, there is a book out there, uh, the composer, the, written by Michael Kogras, American composer, Pulitzer Prize winner. He passed away a few years back. Uh, he wrote a book called Lessons with Kumi. 
and he, he does give exercises, mental exercises, preparation, how to focus, how to breathe, how to run through mentally, uh, exercises, how to, how to prepare for a speech, how to prepare for, for a high intensity event. Uh, and so what you're saying, Anik, uh, r- r- reminded me of that right away because that's that that that's that's exactly the the right the the way of doing it. So yeah, no, that that that, that yeah. <laughs> I'm rambling, but uh, yeah, it, it was no, great hearing good. that from Annie. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Angela. Do you have anything you yes. want to comment on all this? Yeah, uh, I like very much what Annie offered about um, developing that song, and mm-hmm. I. I suggest to uh, young musicians a way in that in their practice that can help them uh, solidify this, which is very tangible. You know, for us human beings, we have the five senses: the visual, uh, the auditory, the sense of touch, kinesthetic, and the taste and smell. Well, that doesn't quite apply to music, <laughs> but we can use the other senses. For mm-hmm. example, when they are learning. They can remember a few things, how it looks like on the topography of the instrument, how it feels to the hands and to the body as one entirety, how it sounds. Sometimes you can just close your eyes without the visual element and link by hearing and the kinesthetics so that you remove the visual disturbance so you can be more connected. So you can play with a combination of these sensory modalities. Sometimes you bring in all, sometimes you concentrate on one of them. Sometimes you combine two and remove the other one. By doing that, it helps you find a new perspective of how you integrate with the music. There are certain parts, like as um, Annie mentioned earlier, they, they go through the habitual pattern of mindless repetition. So how do we prevent them from being mindless? We give them a very specific goal, but that goal is internally driven. Like, how does it feel to your hand? You have to feel it. How does it look? There's something very, very tangible. It's the visual element. How does the path go? How does the body feel? How does the sound go in relation? So that you can have multiple channels seamlessly integrated to form a very secure memory. And I think the kids also enjoy it a lot because they feel like it's a game. And we can start doing that at a very young age. They find so much fun. And after a while, they grow on their own and they're able to apply this. Just like um, this kind of phenomenon, like uh, in psychology, they call it synesthesia, which is when they have all the senses combined, like Scriabin, when he hears a sound, he can... Uh, see a color. Well, that is that kind of extreme sensory connection. Or like um, Chopin says, he can feel with his fingers, he can feel the sounds. This is in a very similar way, but we can create these intermodal connections at an early age, and that gives it fun and gives it a purpose for them to discover in their practice. So I find it could be very meaningful and very useful to make it more engaging and more interesting for young students to try that. Wow, I love that. I think it's a, the melding of the senses is so important because you can't, you're always within the five senses. There's no period of time when you don't have all five senses at the same time. I mean, given that you're not blind or deaf or mm-hmm. you know, have these other disabilities. And so to practice without engaging these senses is almost to be not human <laughs> for, a little, for a little while. And that's, I think, what the mindlessness comes from when you, you're not engaged. And so what you're, what you're saying is actually you're making practice really fun because you're engaging your senses. And it's harder work. Uh, you know, it's a lot more hard work. You, you can't just play through something and be done. You have to really engage with it. I think that's really important. Um, is there anything else, uh, any, either of you, uh, any of three of you would like to add to what uh, Dr. Andrew just shared? I, I just want to say with engaging other sensories, what that's going to do, the outcome of it in the mm. performance is that's 
you know, everything is going to come from inside when you do yeah. that. It's no longer just playing what's on the page. And, and that's what's going to go out to the audience. That's, that's what the audience will, will see and hear and feel with you. Because whatever you project, that's what people are going to reflect as well. Yeah. Connect and reflect. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the audience also isn't just listening to you with their eyes closed. Or they may, they may be, but a lot of time they're also seeing you. And if it's a live performance, they're feeling your presence. And there's a lot of things like even the way you breathe. Like, of course, talks about breathing and that cueing. There's so much you can tell by how someone breathes. You know, uh, my, yes. my, one of my professors in Montreal would say, I know what the sound is going to be like uh, when they play just by seeing how they prepare for the, for, the, for the motion. And just by seeing the gesture, just by seeing how their elbows move, seeing how they breathe, I know what sound's gonna come out of the piano. And if it's a harsh sound, I know before, it's, before they play it, it's gonna be a bad sound. And there's a lot of visual in, in, uh, intrinsically tied into that. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add, Avgust? No, everything was... Uh... <laughs> Nothing to add on this. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Uh, this has been so such a fascinating conversation. I want to veer us into um, what I really admire about all three of you, which is the way you've developed your careers. And I think this might be very useful for a lot of young musicians, uh, teachers, and other colleagues about how you've developed your careers. Um, for example, with Dr. Angela, you know, forming in your school, um, and then really diving into pedagogical and writing uh, with, you know, Annie, you're doing all these different uh, performances and with orchestra and just developing all sides and your writing as well, you're an arts administrator. So I'd like to dive into this a little bit, you know, because I think this fascinates me personally and I think it will be of much value. Uh, so I guess my question will be, uh, more centered on myself, if you don't mind. So uh, I'm going to ask you first, Annie, if you were just graduating from college now and, you know, you want to have a career of some sort, what are ways in which you feel like people should uh, either discern what they want to do or s get started? And, and what does it, what do you think it takes, especially now in our digital modern age, to kind of get started, get yourself known, but also not sell yourself short? You know, there's a tendency also to feel like, no, I can't do that. I could never find my own business. I'll just stick to what I know. Do you have any ideas or thoughts of that? Yeah. I think having an open mind is incredibly important. You don't want to say, okay, I want to do this and only stick with that one thing because we live in at a time where so many things are changing and shifting with the pandemic, pandemic happening. The way we live our lives are really different now and mm -hmm. going forward I think some of the changes major changes will continue and it will evolve into something different um, it, as, as a musician of course everyone wants to perform but even that in itself where do you want to perform how do you want to perform do you want to be a soloist do you want to be a chamber musician or orchestral musician um, it, you, you want to know what your options are first, and then think about, visualize where you think you might fit and work towards it, but don't lock yourself with just that one thought, okay, I'm gonna be just the chamber musician. Mm. Then you might miss out opportunities on other things, or, or if you say, okay, all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do everything online and not think about <laughs> you know, other possibilities. It, I mean, there, it, People think differently, and, and I think it's important to just kind of keep your mind open and, mm -hmm. and don't even rule out learning a different skill. I know a lot of mus young musicians are learning coding and, yep. and creating apps, and it's a great thing for musicians because some of them are creating apps for theory training or, or you know, different types of, of mu things that, that beginner musicians can use to learn, some kind of education tools. So, so mm -hmm. by picking up a new skill, sometimes can take and help you, you with your career as a musician. So wow. that would be my advice. That's <laughs> great. No, that's really, <laughs> yeah, that's really great advice. Uh, Dr. Angela, I want to talk, you know, would you mind sharing uh, in this, in this, I feel like mm -hmm. there's a tendency 
in the past perhaps to specialize and say oh I'm just this uh, and I think uh, Annie you mentioned that no we should stay open um, can you share a little bit about your journey you know uh, on not specializing uh, realizing no I wouldn't I can do so many other things and I want to do these things and I would argue you've done these things exceptionally well can you say a bit of your story on how mm -hmm. you launched into all this well I um, okay, there's a lot of background. I didn't start as a musician. I started as from the medical field. And uh, after completing my medical training, actually I feel that it's not for me. And out of my love, I go for music. That is mm. my personal choice to give up what I did previously. But my previous training gave me the foundation of how to think and approach from a more scientific perspective, while I had the good fortune of studying with very excellent mentors that introduced me to music, and from a later age where I have the maturity to integrate what I learned in the scientific field. Now, looking back into even further than my existence, think of Leonardo da Vinci. He, as the Renaissance man, combined arts and science since the early days of, us, of our modern civilization. We as artists are not solely artists, but also scientists. If you can fuse those two disciplines, and it's not limited to the both, there are many out there now. If we are able to fuse that and find an angle that you can find a niche for yourself, that is the best way for yourself because it's important to know your strengths but also to know your weaknesses. To know those weaknesses is where you need to replenish the, the insight for, from mm -hmm. certain disciplines because now is the, the technology is I increasing at an exponential rate where the chips get outdated uh, and uh, ever so fast in a few months. And we can't be outdated. We are the ones who create those chips. We have to maintain our relevance to the world. So that's why we have to be the ones to be in flux and we have to learn. Most often a pitfall that I've seen in musicians is they really pigeonhole themselves as only a musician. The oh, I am only a musician. This should be turned around and that I am a, mus a musician, which means I have learned all the basics from the discipline to the confidence to the presentation and everything else that I have now the wherewithal to assimilate that and apply everything else that I'm interested and bring it into the equation and live it out to bring the best that you can. You can be a musician and many other things to make you a better person to contribute. So I think don't limit yourself, as Annie said, don't ever Call yourself anything. You're not just a something profession. You can be combined and the combinations are infinite. So just look out ahead, see what it is possible <laughs> because not everyone is destined to be only a musician. You all deserve more. That's how I think. Wow. Well, one of the benefits of this job right now is I get to talk to people who speak so eloquently about this and really inspire me. So thank you for that. That's really... That's really exceptional. Um, of course, you know, you're someone who definitely embodies a lot of this Renaissance um, thinking. Uh, we, we mentioned last time you also love gaming and, you know, incorporate that into your thinking a lot. Do you have anything that you'd like to say about um, developing a career and making sure you embody a lot more than just, I'm just going to stick to this one thing? No, you know, everything that Annie and Andrew have said is great. Um, and we've talked much about it uh, on Monday, uh, last Monday. Um, one thing I, I, I think I would say my, to myself if, if I was 20 years old, or I would say to upcoming musicians is believe in yourself. Believe in what, uh, what you want to do and believe in your qualities. Uh, I think that's 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 very important because we all get people that put us down uh, through, especially talking about college kids, uh, about university type level kids. We all get 
put down by our peers, we all get put down because of failures and whatnot. Uh, I think it, it's very important to believe in what you want to accomplish and, and, and in your goals. Uh, that belief is, is uh, I think, is one of the most important one out there. Um, after that, you know, be, you know, expanding the horizons of, of your horizon is very important as well. We talked about earlier about uh, uh, how pianists are, you know, in, in our case, pianists being all alone on stage or in a practice room. Uh, so expanding that knowledge by playing chamber music, by doing conducting classes, playing instrumental uh, or instruments, uh, be it percussion or, or strings or whatever, that, that adds as well. Um, but no, definitely believe in yourself, believe in what you want to do, believe in believe in, in your own capabilities. Wow, we really like that. I want to, um, first of all, thank you so much to everyone so far who has contributed uh, such great wisdom and knowledge. Um, I want to kind of end with something that I think is quite important, especially for, well, for everyone. And I think this is something you all of you embody really well. And is that one must take the time to really get to know themselves. You know, if you're going to develop a career, if you're going to perform, you have to know yourself. Even with, I think, choosing repertoire for competitions or for performances, you have to get to know what you play well and what you really enjoy playing. And so knowing yourself is really important. And then it also then facilitates what you do in the future. If you know that you're really passionate about this certain thing, then you'll make the necessary steps to go pursue that. And you know that deep down, no matter what people say, you believe in that because you've really examined it within yourself. So my last question would be, um, and we'll go, you know, probably start with Dr. Angela first. How, what would you say, how has your, or we'll do it two ways. We'll do it either, what have, your, what have you done to really reflect and get to know yourself? Or you can go <laughs> answer this question where, what would you recommend for others in order to get to know yourself better and what you can contribute to the world? Because like you said, Dr. Andrew, you have, we, we're called to do a lot more than just play you know, an instrument. We're called to do so much more. Okay. Well, for me, I was like a little particle that's bouncing everywhere until I somehow found my niche. <laughs> and it, much of my life was haphazard, but I fall on the good fortune of having good mentors at a certain time where I have the maturity. So I see it is like 90% luck and the rest is perseverance and a lot of hard work. And I think that's absolutely necessary. And I think what's important is that when you embark in music or you feel that you're a musician, is not exclusive, meaning more than that, is everyone can learn music. Music gives us a very good foundation to apply to subsequent career paths. Now think of that, C considering normally we all learn music at around six and we go on to university. How many years have we studied music? studied music, 15, 16 years? In order to be a good musician to graduate out of university, we have spent from six years old to 23 uh, countless hours of studying music. That's a lot more combined than a medical doctor. What does yeah. that tell you? You have put in a lot of effort. You have put in your discipline. That shows that you are capable. Now, don't, that, that has already given you the sustenance to tell you you're able to stem from here to anywhere. And it doesn't mean that when you study music or you take a competition that you must only exclusively be a musician. You can be in any career path that you can develop yourself. In addition to that, you can be a musician for life. And that is something that goes with you forever. One thing I don't like to see in young people is they feel that once they've achieved a goal, then it's done. Everything is completed. There's no need for continuation, whether it's achieving a certain level of examinations or competitions or graduating from school. Does it mean that completion of these apparent artificial milestones mean that that's the end of it. If it is, then you've 
misunderstood the whole process of why you got in there. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So yeah. it's very important from the beginning to see that and apply your discipline to any other field that you want because you've gotten the background. So mm -hmm. that's very important. And remember, you can be a professional musician in parallel to your career for life. And I find that I know many professionals. They play better than other professional musicians that I've heard. That is not mutually exclusive. Keep going. And we need more of your efforts so that you can express yourself and in parallel track do whatever other discipline that you are cut out for. Thank you for sharing that. I think what's really beautiful is that you chose music. And so in choosing music, you realize that other people can continue to choose music and it can be something for life. Uh, I think that's so, uh, such a beautiful sentiment because, yeah, you're right. It doesn't end. It doesn't, a musician's life doesn't end. And that's why you have teachers who never retire. That's why you have musicians who play till they're 90, to the day they die, and conductors who even have died on the podium <laughs> because they just continue to do what they love and it's a part of who they are. I love that. Annie, I would love to bring you on the stage to talk about this and uh, either comment on Dr. what Dr. Angela said or to, you know, how have you gotten to know yourself better and in doing so form what, you've, what you're doing now? Well, I first agree with everybody. Music is a lifetime pursuit and it's, it's a, such a beautiful thing to have in life for anybody, professional or not. And I, I actually take that on as a responsibility to to share music and to introduce music to less um, underprivileged children because uh, it all comes down to opportunities, right? A lot of uh, some of the children they don't even know that you can learn music or, or yeah. to have a certain understanding for music until it's introduced to them. So so I think it's important when we can that we try to reach out to those who do not have the opportunity to even know about the, the beauty of music. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, and then in terms of myself, how I got to know myself was a, it, it was a very challenging time what I went through. So. I had the opposite life experience um, as Dr. Angela Chen. I, I started performing when I was six years old, and that was pretty much my life. That's all I knew. I didn't know anything else. And so I just kept on that path, performing piano, picked up viola when I was 10, and I was you know, kind of doing both um, all the way through college, and, and then became a, a full-time symphony musician. And then I became injured to the point where I tried to go back to playing first after one month, after two, after six months, and, and my body just, um, I just couldn't do it. And finally, I was at a point where I had to make a decision on, do I want to just keep doing physical therapy and try and come back to playing music, or do I want to just try something else? And at one point, I decided that why not learn something else? Because there's so much in life. Music is not it. And um, in fact, one of the, the questions you posted, Chris, was um, what will you tell your 20-year-old 20 20 self? For me, that would be there's life outside of the practice room. <laughs> <laughs> because I, mm. I was doing double major. I was practicing six hours a day on each one, which uh, equates to 12 hours a day. <laughs> it's a lot, yeah. It is a lot, but you know, I was, I was performing on both mm -hmm. instruments and, and even just by learning the rep, it would require that much practicing and to, to keep try to keep grow technically and musically, you know, you're a mm -hmm. musician, so you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so anyway, when I stopped playing, it was very difficult at first because I did not know who I am. I, I only knew myself as a musician. And when, when I could not play music, I suddenly was left very vulnerable. And I literally, it, I feel like the world has stopped. I, I don't I don't know what I don't know how to go on. I, I don't know what else I can do. I don't even know who I am, <laughs> you know. And so 
in a way, that was a blessing in disguise because it, it that forced stop made me look at the world from a whole different perspective. And it opened up the horizon for me to have more time to learn about different things in life, which I think is incredibly important. And when I started playing again, which was about four years ago or so, it was a very difficult journey because I was working with a different body. My, my, um, even my hand does not open the same way as, as I did. So, so I had to retrain myself on both instruments and that was a journey in itself. Wow. So, um, so just by going through, going through life, I, I think that's why my emphasis is always about keeping an open mind and don't pigeonhole yourself into just one thing. Because life happens. <laughs> life is wow. unpredictable and, and you have to find a resilience to face whatever comes your way and make the best of it. Thank you so much for sharing such a personal story and your personal journey. It's very inspiring, but also it's relatable to a lot of people because they do get injured and it is from overworking your body and, you know, it happens. And this is really inspiring to hear that there are other things to do. You, you just want to keep your, eye, uh, keep your mind open. Um, I've got someone to turn to you. Do you have uh, any final remarks on getting to know yourself or anything that... <laughs> Hani and Angela have shared. This is incredible. This has been such you an know, incredible conversation. Getting to know my, you know, getting to know myself. You know, it's it's a it's a process. I think we all go through that process, especially when we when we hit tough times in our lives. Uh, whether it uh, and whether the, those tough times are injuries, like Annie. Or, or or tough times being personal or financial, whatever. Uh, in, in, for me, uh, I had a moment, and we talked about it last Monday. We we uh, the moment for me was in 2008 uh, after uh, I left Texas Christian University, uh, where the decision where I had to make a decision what type of repertoire and concert pianist I would be. Would I stick to the traditional uh, and deal with the critics? <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> or would I go towards something uh, completely unknown? Mm -hmm. So that was a, a bit of a soul searching there. Uh, another soul searching moment was when I had to make a decision whether I would come back to France or not. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, um, because it was time. Um, so that that's that's uh, those were two Im Im important moments for me as far as soul searching. Uh, but you know, I've always been a performer. I will remain a performer no matter what. Uh, but at the same time, I I do have other activities on the side. You know that. That, that allow me to kind of take a breather, you know, video games, <laughs> chess, judging competitions. <laughs> wrestling. Uh, well, right, no, I don't wrestle. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 no, I don't know. No. But no, no, I, 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 I definitely, I, you know, getting to know myself was part of the growing process of, of where I'm at today. Mm. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. That's great. No, um, thank you so much for to all three of you for sharing. Uh, this is just uh, personally very curious of me to get to know your journeys, so that it's a way for me to figure out how I could go on my own journey. But I think it's also very useful and helpful to a lot of people who, especially with COVID nineteen, the pandemic. How do you navigate all this? How you know? On one hand, it could be very debilitating, but on the other hand, if you find the time to really discover and take the lockdown and everything to discover what you're really about and what's happening to you and what you can offer to the world, it can be a really helpful time to figure this out. Uh, so I want to thank all three of you for sharing your personal journey and for all your advice. Um, all three of our judges are exceptional musicians, but also very inspiring to me. They're also our judges for the 2021 Sound Associate for Global Competition. So for everyone listening, I really encourage you to 
um, apply for this competition, the website's below. Uh, what's really important about this um, competition is that you get to talk to these judges. You get feedback right away after you play. And a lot of the time, it's really what you want. Uh, you want the affirmation. You want some sort of feedback to see whether it worked or not. And sometimes a lot of competitions don't give you that feedback or they give it to you much later. So we pride ourselves in this competition with being able to give it right away. So you get to hear what the judges think of your playing. We have no time limits uh, for any of the semi-finals and the finalists. Uh, we have no repertoire requirements. Uh, so you can play anything you want. And that's a big ask and it's a wide range for us to listen to. But we want to encourage you to discover your unique voice, which is something we also talked about today and through repertoire, through discovering it, through trying it out and performing it, you actually figure out whether this resonates with you or not. We also have over $100,000 US of uh, value in prizes, uh, with performance opportunities from seminars, scholarships, festivals, uh, graphics design, website designs, or in a way our mission uh, to fulfill our mission of empowering musicians to find their own careers, to build their own careers, to forge what they have in, in ahead of them and to discover your unique voice and contribute to the world. And the fifth thing is that it's all live. And so just like this, you know, in our conversation, it's all live. You play live. It's all broadcasted live. Uh, we don't do recordings for the semifinals and finals. So you have to play live. And it's a very amazing thing to, to do it online. But you have people hearing you right away. So if you're interested and you know somebody's interested, please apply. Uh, we are accepting our applications until November 30th. And with that, I want to thank our guests again. August, Annie, Dr. Angela Chan. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for being such great, such great guests. Thank you Thank so you. much for Thank having you. us. Thank you. And with that, we'll see you soon. Uh, we're broadcast running almost every day on a virtual concert halls, and so we hope to, uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. And we also want to thank our San Espresivo uh, directors. We have Fedor and Ante today. Uh, these are people behind the scenes who make this whole production work, do our tech checks and everything, and you'll get to meet these people if you apply and join us on the virtual stage. So we want to thank History of Music as well for supporting us and for virtual concert halls for hosting all this. So with that, thank you again, and see you next time. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. No matter where you are or who you are, music connects us all. We started with a dream, but now we are paving the future. Welcome to the Sound Espressiva Global Competition. Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes, scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage.